Well, good morning Melbourne, and we've filled out the St Kilda Town Hall, which is fantastic. We had it mostly full last year, it's standing room only, and we're going to talk about today about pyramids, so we would ditch this one. We're not fond of this one, as you may have heard, uh, but we are fond of pyramid schemes. So look, all we need you to do next year is bring an extra 100 people each, <laughs> and we'll fill out the MCG. <laughs> you with me? Yeah, OK, bring it. OK, so here, here you, you've, you've seen the USDA's food pyramid, and, and many of you know it's long and, uh, and sordid history. And the question is, have we done more harm than good? And I think that's what most of us today would contend, that, that the food pyramid needs to go, because some people can do well on this type of diet, which remains the Australian Dietary Guidelines, the New Zealand Dietary Guidelines, it's the Dietary Guidelines in, in this substantive form mostly for most countries around the world. And my contention today is it cause, causes more harm than good, especially for our most vulnerable. And I'm trying to describe a new genre that I've, I've got up, and I think it could be roughly described as what we could now call medical pornography. Um, and I'll just familiarise you with the genre that it's falling into for your, uh, for your satisfaction. There's um, cigarettes there, um, other doctors, scientists are joining in, uh, dentists, Santa Claus, <laughs> babies. Do you notice a subtle change? Uh, uh, Heart Foundation endorsed food, at least you get a free mask there. Uh, whole grains are everywhere, even more whole grains. And the health experts have joined in as well. Um, and in the end, most perversely of all, you can open happiness. And if happiness is about insulin resistance, diabetes, uh, and that long period of disability that most of us, hopefully not most of you or me, but most of society is now suffering before death, I mean, you're going to die. You won't, that won't worry you in the end. Uh, and, but I think what we do worry about, especially in public health, is the amount of disability, we call it uh, morbidity, before you die. So this is written about a lot by other bloggers, that this notion of living long and dropping dead is what we're aspiring to. And we think that diet has such a crucial component in that. And one of the major mechanisms is how we regulate that teaspoon or so of glucose that floats around in our, our bloodstream. And so you'll know, um, that when you have some carbohydrates beyond a, that teaspoon, your body needs to dispose of that glucose. It can be toxic, uh, and it does that quickly with the hormone insulin. Here's my little diagram. Some, uh, there's, there's the cell wall there. Some carbohydrates turn up. That's three quarters of a piece of bread, any colour, th three teaspoons. Uh, you produce a lot of insulin. That's the orange stuff because you are now you are insulin resistant. Uh, when you produce a lot of insulin, you turn off your ability to burn fat, you will store, uh, the, the insulin tries to move and store the, that glucose in cells. If it can't do that, then it'll go and store some of it as fat. So it opens up the cell, it might shove some in the cell, it might cause some glycolytic damage, but it'll put some also in the fat cells. So you end up with this situation, you end up with, uh, this is a glucose response to eating glucose, that's a normal one, but you can end up with this condition. And we'll talk a lot about this condition today. It's, I call it hyperinsulinemia, but it's just high insulin in response to glucose. And the argument we're trying to make now is that when you start to understand that process, then you get a much better understanding of what keeps us well, what manages our weight, what keeps us happy and healthy, but also what underpins all of these big four chronic diseases, cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and the neurodegenerative class of diseases, that insulin can underpin those. And it's caused by the condition of insulin resistance. Well, what causes insulin resistance, this metabolic dysregulation? Well, here's what I know about from the literature so far. Uh, we know that stress does through the brain and the, and the uh, adrenal axis. Probably a poor night's sleep does as well. Uh, too much exercise can be inflammatory if you take it to excessive form, especially burning glucose. Um, sitting around too much does that. Uh, smoking does that. A whole bunch of environmental toxins can cause inflammation and insulin resistance. Uh, getting sunburnt can, equally not enough sun, 
you don't make enough vitamin D, um, you're insulin resistant. Uh, there's a bunch of dietary things that you'll be familiar with. The high sugar diet itself is inflammatory. Uh, high trans fats, omega-6 fatty acids, uh, alcohol in excess, um, even uh, gut microbes, still, we're still trying to understand that field. Uh, your genes, your ethnicity, I think certainly plays a part, especially if you're a, a, a Pacific Islander, that's a, an example of a group that's highly insulin resistant. Uh, uh, maybe your age does as well. We, we know that we, that's a factor, but whether it's just a result of these other factors, we don't know. Uh, and obesity itself is inflammatory, especially around your gut. Um, and perversely high insulin also itself provokes more insulin resistance. So I think that's pretty much the whole of modern life really. So you become insulin resistant, it results in this condition called hyperinsulinemia, uh, and we can now start to have a more parsimonious theory about why we get fat, uh, why we get unwell and what to do about it. And when we start to look at the, the science, the direct and indirect causes of all of these diseases here are through this insulin resistant, impaired insulin homeostasis. Uh, we don't catch it in modern medicine until much later to that, when you present with high blood pressure, uh, high blood glucose, uh, these, these other sort of things. Those are markers of end stage disease. We can catch them much earlier by thinking about how we respond to dietary carbohydrate load. And that's why I'm not the first to suggest this, but uh, you might think about when you eat, restricting your carbohydrates to more or less of an extent depending on your insulin sensitivity. And that's really where we're coming from today. Not everyone needs to restrict their carbohydrates. Um, you can if you want to, um, and many of us choose to do that. But as you become more insulin resistant, if you wish to stay healthy, that seems to be uh, an important part of that. And people always say to me, well, look, that's great, we, but we know people can lose weight on all sorts of diets because it's about energy in and energy out. Uh, which is a truism, of course it is. You can't de defeat that law of thermodynamics. But what we haven't examined, uh, these are, this is the A to Z weight loss trial of Chris Gardner's group in, in the States, and he put people on four different types of diets, diets randomised. And these are individuals, each bar represents an individual's weight loss, lack of weight loss, or weight gain over the year, though, after a year. And you can see what I've tried to do here is people. Now, regardless of what diet you put on, some benefit. So there's the people who benefit on a low-carb, high-fat diet. But some people, nothing happens. That's the orange. And some people actually put on weight. That's the red. So we shouldn't forget this. Diets aren't 100% effective for everyone for, for all sorts of reasons. But we can compare using this method across different types of diet. Here's the Barry's here's his own diet. There's the, my estimate of benefit. No change in harm. You can see what you'd probably choose there. Uh, here's another Mediterranean style diet, the Learn diet, and here's Dean Ornish's uh, low fat diet, which probably has the least benefit um, of them all in a moderate harm. So that's from public health. I like to think about that because um, while you can have individual successes, we're very concerned about uh, what would happen if we apply these sorts of things to whole groups of people, and you can see that. What's more interesting though is when you look at these data here and you look under the under the hood, and you look at weight loss by whether you're insulin resistant or insulin sensitive, you see this. These are the results from the low fat diet. People don't lose very much weight at all if they're insulin resistant on a low fat diet. But if you're insulin sensitive, well, it can work. Frankly, it's, it's deprivation, and I probably wouldn't do it. But some people choose to do that and do just fine. But if you're on a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, it's similarly efficacious. It works about the same regardless of your insulin sensitivity. And importantly, probably that half of people that have this impaired insulin homeostasis in society are the half we need to help the most. And that's why we're going where we're going. I often like to, uh, I'm not going to do it with you today because it would just be mean, mean-spirited, but I do it with my students at the university. I show them the results of these sorts of diets. These are biomarkers of of metabolic health that are reasonably well known. The orange is the improvement uh, for the low carb diet and the blue is the improvement for the low fat diet. I often just like to switch the labels around and, and say, look, I was wrong, I'm just admitting my wrongness. Uh, and I do a whole lecture on my wrongness and then at the end I 
remind them, in fact, I just switched the labels round. And that's an important point, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, the results you get from going on a low carbohydrate diet, um, these are the, some metabolic markers, here's some more for uh, inflammation this time, the, the low carbohydrate high fat diet is anti-inflammatory, the low fat diet is either neutral or, or slightly pro-inflammatory. Just imagine if we did the, our, what we're suggesting here and the results the other way around. We'd be run out of town and fairly too. Uh, and so we need to, I, I feel that should, it's only fair that works both ways. And one of the reasons for that is we've learnt over the last decade or so that eating fat doesn't necessarily make you fat, but more than that, eating fat doesn't translate to fats in your blood in the same way that eating carbohydrate does. So these are, this is fats in your blood, triglycerides, for two groups when they start on a high carbohydrate meal, but then after a period of time we put one group on a low carbohydrate diet and feed them that same low carbohydrate diet. So they're eating a diet that's three times higher in fat and three times higher in saturated fat, yet the fats in their blood are half. And we feed the other group the same low, uh, low fat diet and they have twice as many fats in their blood. And Steve Finney will remind you again of this this afternoon. He's taught me this over the last couple of days. We are told you are what you eat when in fact you are what you save from what you eat. And you'll hear that again and again, and that's an important distinction. You are what you save from what you can eat. So many of the people you'll hear from today, especially Professor Noakes, are under fire for their lack of evidence for these things. And we argue actually the contrary. The, the dietary guidelines in the first place were never based on evidence. They were based on a hypothesis, the lipid hypothesis. It turns out not to be a hypothesis that's supported by data. And part of the mistake was that, is that when you look at evidence, it needs to triangulate. It needs to triangulate across all of the scientific evidence. It needs to be plausible and show in mechanisms. It needs to turn out experimentally when you see it epidemiologically. But also it needs to be consistent with anthropological and cultural wisdom. Uh, and it needs to be with what we see in our own clinical practice and what people across now this new shared experience the internet is showing. And we're seeing those things come together with this low carbohydrate uh, approach to living that we see a much more parsimonious triangulation of the evidence. And that's encouraging. What we don't know though is much about how to implement this to the public. You're here, most of you uh, 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 buy into the science of that or are well educated and, and understand that, but how, do some, how does someone like me, whose job is it to help the health of the public at large, do that? And there's all sorts of brands for this type of eating and they mean different things, they invoke a different response. You could talk about the Tim Noakes diet and he would not even say there's such a thing, he would call it the Benting diet himself and then you'll talk about paleo and primal, those, what do those mean, uh, and ketogenic. There's, there's a bunch of brands that relate in different ways to eating whole real food, actual whole plants and animals, but also restricting to more or less extents carbohydrates and proteins, and they mean different things. And that, I think, is confusing for the public. And we end up with this. I, I took this picture at McDonald's <laughs> in St Kilda. This, this is someone's brother. Uh, that we can... It's, a, it's an interesting area of nutrition because you use the word primal or paleo to describe an approach which is evolutionary biology and people object to that basis alone, which is interesting because in any other branch of science using evolutionary biology is a, is a basis, a no-brainer, uh, yet when we start to talk about this paleo thing, it, it's turned into a brand um, and it sells books well um, and it describes different people's approaches, but we shouldn't discount evolutionary biology. And you see that sort of thing. Here's a screenshot of some of the top health podcasts on iTunes and you'll notice some of those, Mark's Daily Apple and uh, Bulletproof Exec and uh, Fat Burning Man. Incredibly popular with a, with, a, with, with a group, but public at large we don't know. We know that it works well. We can read successful case studies for single people, but we don't know what happens when we apply that to the population, if we even could. Um, is there one happy person and, and dozens of unhappy, or is it the other way around? And we call that number to treat. We don't understand that. 
I've tried to, more recently, myself and Dr. Karen Zinn, who you'll hear from shortly, uh, develop some new guidelines which we think will be more appropriate than the, the food pyramid based ones. Uh, I've called those the real food guidelines. Real food uh, for real people based on actual real evidence. Uh, and so this is, this is our take on this. Here we go. Uh, the first is eating, eating vegetables and, and uh, seasonal fruits every day. I'm not, I won't talk about carbohydrates or macronutrients here. Uh, uh, buy and prepare foods from whole, unprocessed sources of dairy, nuts, seed, eggs, meat, fish and poultry. Uh, keep sugar, added sugars and processed foods to a minimum in foods and drinks. If you drink alcohol, keep your intake low. And I think most importantly of all, prepare, cook and eat minimally processed traditional foods with family, friends and your community. So you'll see there, from a public health perspective, a, a, a description of food that was once alive, it's recently recognised, I'm trying to introduce this term called the HI, forget GI, I'm talking about HI, human interference. It looks like it was recently alive for the bulk of the, the healthy population, that's a good thing to eat. But then we need to think about, um, here's our first go at some sub-guidelines for things like, uh, this is one I'm just developing this morning actually about diabetes. Uh, diabetes is a problem of carbohydrate intolerance. You will need to restrict carbohydrates in your diet. So we can start to make specific recommendations from there. So there you go, uh, the real food guidelines. I think it's time we, we it, the government isn't going to change these guys. This is going to have to come up and that's why I'm asking each of you to do the 100 people thing. If you don't get to the MCG, okay, I'm realistic. Uh, but, but start, keep talking, because you are the people who can do this. Real food uh, for real people based on real evidence. It's, it's not going to come top down. We need your help. Thank you very much.